beginnings and endings of the world. Okay, uh, this is a topic which is very, very close to the heart of every human being, beginning and end of the world. Because as soon as we humans began to think, uh, that is an important uh, statement, as soon as we humans began to think. Yeah? Uh, according to the latest knowledge that we have, uh, human beings started about three and a half, maybe four million years ago. We became human, or we started on the road to being human about four and a half million years ago. But by only about 200,000 years ago, we became fully human. That means whoever lived 200,000 years ago and us, there is no difference. We were Homo sapiens. All right? And Homo sapiens has a lovely translation in Malay and in Sanskrit, Manusya. Manusya, that which has a mind to think. That's what. And how did we get that name? We got that name because somewhere along the line, we humans separated from animals. We, we are all the same. Humans and animals are exactly the same. Buddhism teaches that. But there is a difference between us and animals in that we can think, we can use the faculty of thinking, all right? And that happened when we began to what is called the evolution of self-consciousness. A time came about, not very long ago, about 40,000 years ago, when we humans became aware that we are human. We have no idea whether animals have that same concept, but we do. We asked ourselves three important questions. Long ago, we asked this three important Who am I? Now, every religion in the world addresses itself to this one question, Who am I? And that divides up again, because... All the religions in the world can be divided into two very, very broad categories. Uh, Taoism, Buddhism and Confucianism, they begin with the idea that the human being is important. But Christianity, Judaism and Islam, we call them theocentric religions. Theocentric religions are religions which start off with God. That means God created the world, God created humans. Whatever happens to us is the creation of God and everything goes back to God again. Theocentric. Judaism, Christianity, Islam. We Buddhists and uh, Taoists and Confucianists we come from another point of view, which is, you cannot know God. You cannot know that which you cannot observe. All that you can observe is the human being. And this human being is where, we, if we want answers to the world, to our problems, we must start with the human, because that's all we have. That's all the evidence we have. Uh, Long uh, Confucius was asked, Master, teach us to understand heaven. And Confucius said, Why are you trying to understand heaven when you don't understand earth? Understand earth. Heaven knows how to look after itself. You don't be a capo and worry about heaven. We've never seen heaven. We don't know what heaven is. Nobody has been there, has come back. We don't know anything. What do we know? We know that we have Earth. We have Earth and planet Earth is here and we are here. So if we want to understand ourselves, our starting point is not God, but our starting point is ourselves. And these three religions, we say, are homocentric, man-based religions as opposed to God-based religions. And we began this separation 
about 40,000 years ago, before religion even came about. Long before religion came about, we asked this question, who am I? One question. Next question, what am I doing here? When my consciousness when, uh, began to evolve, with the evolution of consciousness, we began to ask, is there a purpose in our lives? Are we, what are we doing here? Now, just, just consider yourselves. What are we doing here every day? What do we do? We wake up in the morning, we brush our teeth, thank you. We brush our teeth, we comb our hair, those of us who have hair, uh, we, we dress up, we get into the car, we drive through traffic jams, we get into the office, we switch on our computer, and most of the time computers don't work, and, uh, uh, and we are happy about that because then we can waste time. And then after that, we go for lunch break. After lunch break, we come back, we play with the computer a little bit more, watch the clock. By four o'clock, we rush out. Rush out, get into another traffic jam, and we come home. When we come home, what do we do? We relax about two minutes, and then we watch television, and then we watch um, television, we have dinner, and then we go to bed. Next morning, we wake up, we brush our teeth, we comb our hair, we get into the car, we play with the computer. <gasps> What apa? At the end of each day, when you sit down and ask yourself, so what? What is this life? Who am I? I don't know. What am I doing here? What, what is the purpose of my life doing here? Who am I? What am I doing here? And the last and most important question, am I needed? Are you needed? Does the world need you? Think about that very, very carefully. How important are you to the universe? Yeah? Just by way of comparison, for every single one of you, we are outnumbered by ants alone. 200 million to one. For each one of us, there's 200 million ants. So, how important are you? Who am I? What am I doing here? Am I needed? As part of this question, who am I, what am I doing here, am I needed, is part of the evolution of self-consciousness. As we became humans, we started to ask this question. These three questions. And the way these three questions were answered was, one group went one way and said, it all began with God. Who are you? You are created by God. We'll have to turn around and okay. Um, yes. And now I will turn to the slide. And I can't look at you because I got no eyes at the back. So I'll have to manage. Uh, we'll try. Okay. So where, where, where are we? Evolution of self-consciousness, we answered these three questions. By the way, these are called the three existential questions. Questions about our existence. Who am I? What am I doing here? Am I needed? All right? And we can only ask these questions because we are manusia, because we have a mind which can think. Okay. One way of answering the question, through God. Everything we surrender to God. On the other hand, the homocentric point of view, no, it's nothing to do with God, it's to do with us. So if you want to ask the answers to these questions, we have to search for this ourselves. All right? And that led us to the next one. The next question was, this is how religion got invented in the first place. Notice my language. Religion got invented. We humans came first. And then we needed to answer these questions. And the only way we could answer these questions was by inventing religion. The Buddhist stand, the Taoist stand, and the Confucianist stand is, God did not make me. I made God. Now that is not a sacrilegious statement. Think about it. 
there is a uh, 18th, 18th century, there was a French philosopher who said, very interestingly, even if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. Because there are so many questions in the world we cannot answer. And as long as we can't answer those questions, we will have to say, leave it to God. Yeah? This is another thing in the history of mankind. Ada, tada. Tada, It's okay. Thank you. No, no problem. No problem. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, where were we? Uh, even if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. This brings me to another point. I, I, I'm slowly leading on to our topic, but I, I need to set the background. Why are we discussing this question in the first place? Beginning and ending of the world. Is it necessary? And what is the Buddhist attitude to this question? Does the world have a beginning? Or does the world have an ending? Okay. Uh, to do that, the background. The background is, first, the two theocentric, God-based religions, and homocentric, the man-based religions. Okay. Now, the next question is, uh, why was it necessary to invent a God? Okay, we are talking very much from a theocentric point of view. Okay. Uh, why was it necessary to invent a God? This was a Christian concept. What I'm going to tell you now is not a Buddhist concept. It is a Christian concept. It came out in, again, the 19th century. Okay? Uh, and here, a Christian priest said, used the term, God of the gaps. What does God of the gaps mean? God is everything we do not know. God is everything we do not know. Go back to the evolution of self-consciousness. When our ancestors started looking at the universe, they saw a lot of things they couldn't explain. For example, they saw thunder, they saw lightning, they saw earthquakes, they saw volcanic eruptions, they saw nature very, very powerful and very fierce. And they couldn't understand how this operated. So, our early ancestors started talking about these things in terms of a god. God of thunder, god of lightning, god of rain, god of whatever. So, at that time, 20, 30,000 years ago, because our knowledge of the world was so limited, we attributed a lot of things to God. The, everything we didn't understand was God. Thunder, lightning, rain, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions. They were all God. And they actually prayed to these things. All right? So at that time, God was very, very powerful. Therefore, the gap, in, the gap in our knowledge was so wide. God of the gaps, God was very powerful. However, as science began to evolve, as more and more we humans started to understand how the universe operates, we said, aha, uh -huh, the volcanic eruption is not God. Tsunamis are not God. Tsunamis are to do with plate tectonics. Thunder and lightning has nothing to do with God. It has to do with electricity. So as time went on, as our, our knowledge increased, the gap became smaller and smaller. Do you see the point? The gap became smaller and smaller, and less and less we were attributing things to a God. All right? However, now this is the important point. However, will we ever come to a point when we will not need God anymore? Science, for example, cannot explain this other problem that we humans have. Science could, can never explain. 40,000 years ago, our ancestors asked the same question. Before I was born, what was I? Where was I? Did I exist before I was born? Now that I am alive, 
there's two parts of me. There's a physical part. Notice all religions have this same concern. There is a physical part when it dies, we bury, we cremate, we throw in the sea or whatever. But that's not the important part. There is another thinking part. Where did that come from? When I am alive, these two are interacting. Most religions call it body and soul. Now you put the body and soul together, you get a human being. Now the question was asked, when I die, something leaves and something remains behind. What is it that remains behind? No, easily explain. The table, this body, this floor, this wall, same. All right, this is the physical part, easily explained. What is not easily explained is the mental part. Where does this consciousness go? Does it go anywhere? Does it, does it, when you die, it stops. During the Buddha's time, there were those people who were called the materialists. The materialists, like many people today, believe there is, number one, no meaning to life. You are born because your parents get together. You die when you stop breathing. That's it. After you die, there is no purpose in being good or bad or whatever. Just exist. They were called the materialists. And the Buddha rejected them. Buddha said, no, that, that will make our lives meaningless. We are worth a little bit more than that, on the one hand. On the other hand, already during the Buddha's time, there were those who were saying, with the uh, eternalist, meaning God created me, God created my body and my soul. And who is God? Brahma. And what is body called? Atman. Yeah? And what is uh, body is called Anatman. And the soul is called Atman. So Atman and Anatman come together. These are not Christian concepts. These are Hindu concepts we are talking about at the moment. Okay, so these two come together and at death, one thing leaves and another thing departs. So, and, and the whole question about when it goes, it goes to heaven and hell. Where, what is heaven? What is hell? How do you qualify to go to heaven? By being good. So what is good? Now, no, no two religions agree on what is good. For some, having four wives is good. For others, having no wife is better. Okay, and so, so what, is, what is good? They can't even agree about heaven. Do you know no two religions talk about heaven in the same way? For example, did you know, when we think of heaven, we think of heaven as a nice, cool place, whereas if you go to hell, you burn and burn and burn and it's very, very hot. Not everybody agrees that hell is such a hot place. In Tibet, and, and among the Eskimos, they believe if you die and you are a bad guy, you will go to hell where it's so cold that you will be frozen. You can't even move. Hell is a very, very cold place. However, heaven is nice and hot. So heaven and hell were created according to what we think is good or bad. What is my point? My point is, even if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. So as long as we don't know, we need God. But the, as more and more we know, and this is where the Buddha comes in, when you gain enlightenment, the necessity for a God becomes irrelevant. There is nothing more that you do not know. And that's why the Buddha says, Dhammo have rakkati dhamma charim. Those who are, who are protected, who, those who live by the Dharma will be protected by the Dharma. You don't need anything. You only need knowledge. So the God of the gap is becoming...
becoming smaller, but we still cannot answer a lot of questions, therefore God will still be necessary. For example, how birth takes place. We can't explain what is the origin of life, which is our topic today. Which is the origin of life. Does the world have a beginning? Does the world have no beginning? And so on. So, the background to this talk is that when we humans began the process of the evolution of self-consciousness, we began to ask these questions about who am I, where did I come from? Where did I come from? And as long as we didn't know the answer, we said God created us. But when our knowledge and our wisdom arises and increases, then we will say, no, this is the Buddhist stand, there is no beginning to the world, there is no, you have no beginning. Which brings us to the next point, life. What do we mean by life? Did we create life? Did God create life? Or was life always there? Now, what does that mean? That means that the homocentric religions say that God made life. That every one of you who lives today was created by God as a special, which he called a soul. But the Buddhist stand is no. What we call a life is not something that was created at one moment, but something that came from somewhere else. That means the world had no beginning. There was a guy, his name was Malunkya Putta. Now Malunkya Putta comes to the Buddha and asks the Buddha, <coughs> Master, this is very important for us to know because very clearly the Buddhists stand about the beginning of the world and whether we need to waste our time asking this question is answered in this sutra. It is called the Malunkya Putta Sutra. The, now, Malunkya Putta is a monk. Now, Malunkya Putta, although he is a monk and has come to study under the Buddha, he cannot get rid of the idea that we all have where did I come from? So he comes and challenges the Buddha. That's where he makes the mistake. He's very rude. He tells the Buddha, Master, you have to... Notice the way he talks to the Buddha. You must explain to me as if the Buddha owes him anything. You must tell me, did the world have a beginning? Does the world have a beginning? Does the world have an ending? Does the world have no beginning? Does the world have no ending? Does the world have both a beginning and a no beginning? Does the world have both a no beginning, a no ending and an ending? All right, all together, six questions he asks the Buddha. And then he challenges the Buddha and says, if you cannot explain these questions to me, I am going to leave you. And this is a very important teaching where the Buddha turns around and tells Ma Malunkya Putta, Malunkya Putta, you are challenging me and you are threatening that you are going to leave me if I cannot answer these questions. That's the important point. If I cannot answer these questions, Malunkya Putta, in the first place, did I ask you to follow me? I didn't ask you to come and join me. You came freely. Now, if you want to leave, the door is open, you can go. I am not going to apologize to you, and you don't challenge me. This, this is important because uh, in Buddhism, we do not beg people to come in to our doors. The knowledge is there. If you want, come and study. If you don't like it, you are free to leave. It's not an arrogant attitude. But it is an attitude of neutrality. Yeah? If you want to believe, come. If you don't want, go. But we are not going to chase after you. That's why we don't have conversions in Buddhism. So the Buddha tells Malunkya Putta, 
Malunkia Putta, that is not an. Our topic is beginning and end of the world. Alright? Now, what the Buddha says is, it is irrelevant to our present need. Who am I? What am I doing here? Am I needed? It is irrelevant to these three questions that you know whether the world ended, began, or the world is going to end. Do you see, we Buddhists take the opposite stand from the theocentric religions which say the world was created and the world will have a definite end. Oh, by the way, the word for that is the belief that the world will end one day, Islam, Christianity and Judaism, there's a word for it. It's called eschatological. E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Eschatology is the belief that the world will end one day, suddenly. So many, all these three religions are waiting for the day when the world will end suddenly. Now, the Buddhists say, no, that is not, number one, is not relevant. Then the Buddha tells Malunke Putta, you ask me, does the world have a beginning? Does the world have an ending? Now, I'm telling you, that question is a waste of time. He did not say, I do not know the answer. That's in, again very important. The Buddha only taught what was relevant. The Buddha only taught what was relevant to your present need. Okay? That is why you will find the Buddha says, monks, I only teach one, one thing. My, I'm putting out four fingers, but he says, I only teach one thing. I only teach suffering, the cause of suffering, and the end of suffering, and the way to the end of suffering. I only teach, to 45 years, the Buddha said, I only, don't waste my time asking me other questions. Suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering and the way to end that suffering. What we call the four noble truths. The Buddha said, that's all I'm interested in. Don't ask me about anything else. Do not ask me how the world began and how the world is ending. Then he tells Malunke Putta, Malunke Putta, you're asking me this irrelevant question. And I'm telling you, you remind me of a man who was shot by a poison arrow. He is shot by a poisoned arrow. This is a very important sutra that we have to know because this is the uh, uh, sutra we use to answer those who, who challenge Buddhism and say, you Buddhists don't talk about the end, beginning of the world. You don't know about the beginning of the world. If we, for us, no problem. God created the world. And we know God is going to end the world. As you Buddhists, you, 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 you talk around. Okay? Here is the answer. The answer is not that the world had a beginning or no beginning. It is irrelevant to your present need. You are like a man who is shot by a poisoned arrow. That is the problem. The problem is you have been shot by a poisoned arrow. Now your friends come and want to pull out the arrow and you say, No, you cannot pull out this arrow until you find out who shot the arrow. So they run and go and find out who shot the arrow. When they come back with that, they run. Back. He says, no, I want to know his father's name, his mother's name, his caste, his job. What was the poison made of? What was the arrow made of? By the time they found out all the questions to his answer, answers to his questions, he died. Now, the, what, how does that relate? Here you are struck by the poisoned arrow of existence. You are born. As soon as you are born, you are struck with old age, disease, death. Whatever you want, you cannot get. Whatever you don't want, chases after you. And all these frustrations are your present existence. Knowing where it started is not the answer. You're wasting your time trying to find out the answer 
to where it started. So Buddhists say that today's talk is irrelevant. Beginning and end of the world. Okay? But, so it is, it is irrelevant because the Buddha says that is not your problem. It does not help you to know who your great-grandfather was. You have the problem of old age, disease, death. Whatever you want, you don't get. This is what we call Dukkha. The human condition is characterized by Dukkha. What is Dukkha? Dukkha does not mean suffering. It's, it's a very simple translation of the word suffering. It, dukkha has a much deeper psychological, mental meaning. Yeah? It's not a physical suffering. Physical suffering is one, but mental suffering. Dukkha, I mentioned this a bit earlier, at the end of every day we sit down and ask ourselves, so what? What have we achieved? Yeah, macam anjing kerja eko, pusing, 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 sebab belakang gatal. Those of you who don't know bahasa, it's like a dog chasing his tail, going round and round and round because his backside is itchy. All right? And so you're going round and round. And isn't that what we are doing today? Isn't that our problem? That is what is meant by dukkha, contemptible emptiness. This constant sense of frustration. This constant sense that things are not fulfilling. We are not satisfied all the time, unsatisfactoriness. So the Buddha says, that is your disease. And knowing that is your present disease. What has yesterday got to do with it? And this is another thing that the Buddha teaches, that one day the Buddha asked, yeah, why are Buddhist monks so calm and peaceful? Yeah? They, I mean, we are not talking about modern day Buddhist monks. Uh, okay, a, a Buddhist monk is not simply one who shaves his hair and wears yellow robes and goes around burning other people's villages. Those are not Buddhist monks. Yeah? But a real Buddhist monk, one who really practiced the Buddha was asked, why are they so calm and peaceful? Here was the Buddha's answer, which is the way we should conduct our lives. The Buddha says, they do not worry about the past. They do not ask how did the world begin. They do not worry about the past. They do not worry about the future because the future is not yet come. But by remaining ever in the present, are they calm and serene. A Buddhist monk does not worry about what's going to happen to him tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow you will be meeting Venerable Gunaratna, H. Gunaratna. He is 86 years old. All right? uh, he lived here from uh, 1958 to 1968. Ten years he lived in his temple. Then he went to Washington and today he is a very, very famous monk in, and he'll be coming to visit you tomorrow. Okay? Now, he's, he had a heart bypass. He's very frail, walks very slowly, he's very small. And uh, last night I asked him, Bante, did you come alone? He said, yeah. I said, you've been all the way from Washington, D.C. You traveled all alone and you came by yourself? Nobody to accompany you? He said, well, no, no, I wasn't alone. There was a lot of people accompanied me. There were 700 other passengers in the plane. <laughs> okay? Now, what does that mean? He understands life so well, yeah, that if he sat down and worried what will happen to me, I'm sick, I'm an old man, this, that, 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 he is spending all his time worrying. Instead, what does he do? I go. If I drop dead, so good, I drop dead. It's not my problem what happens to me when I drop dead. Other people have to worry about what to do with my passport and how to cremate me. That's a fan and that comes, they do not worry about the past. They do not worry about the future, but by remaining ever in the present, are they calm. And that is why we use the wheel as our symbol. Why do we have the wheel? 
the wheel because the wheel only touches the ground at one point. Only one point. And then it moves. And then it moves. And then it moves. Now, all that matters is that one contact point. All right? Don't worry about the past. Don't worry about the future. But remain ever in the present. If you can just follow that one teaching, you will be a very, very happy Buddhist, really. You'll be really, very happy Buddhist. You, you won't worry about your EPF and your rates going down and whatever. You'll be happy. You'll die anyway. So, okay? So, that is the teaching to be found in the Malunkya Putta Sutra where the Buddha says it is... Now, the Buddha does not say the world has no beginning. He does not say the life has no beginning. He says it is beginningless. Amatagga. The world beginning. And this has been proven today. God did not create the world in six days. Yeah? But worlds are being created and worlds are being destroyed. Our present planet Earth is only 4.5 billion years ago, made up of raw material that came from a burst up before that. And we will last, planet Earth is last another 500 million years, and then it will die, and then it will disintegrate. The principle of impermanence, whatever comes together must fall apart. So, did the world have a beginning? Yes, it did. Sometime long, long, long ago. But the fact that it had a beginning has nothing to do with you now. It had a beginning. You are stuck with the problem now. You are here. Did life have a beginning? It may have had a beginning. But talking about whether life had a beginning is as irrelevant as asking, does the circle have a beginning? What is the starting point of a circle? You, 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 you're just stuck. What, where does a circle start? Similarly, where does life start? And does the fact of your knowing that there is a life out there, does the fact that you know you had the beginning of a life mean anything to you now? Now look at all those who say, God made me. Does the fact that they know that God made them make any difference to the way they are behaving today, killing, lying, stealing? It's irrelevant. So the Buddha says, don't worry about that. Worry about now. How do I live happily in the present moment? And that's where the Brahma Viharas and all that come in. Okay? So, this is the answer the Buddha gave. However, this does not mean that the Buddha does not talk about the universe. He does. In other contexts. The context here is, if you are worrying about your happiness, don't worry about beginnings and endings. Worry about the now. But, the... the Agganya Sutra. Uh, the background to this Agganya Sutra is very interesting. I, I love this sutra. It's a very, very long sutra. Uh, and it's a very old sutra, meaning that there's every chance that the Buddha actually spoke this sutra. Anyway, the story goes like this. Uh, I think I have to sh give you a little bit of background, those of you who don't know uh, Hinduism. Uh, Hinduism believes that God created human beings, uh, Brahma. And when he created human beings, Maha Brahma, from his mouth came the Brahmins. From his arms came the Kshatriyas. From his legs came the Vaishyas. And from his feet came the Shudras. Who are these? These are what we call the four castes. The caste itself is a Portuguese word. But in Hinduism, they call them Varna. Varna means color. Yeah? The fair-skinned people, yeah, the Aryans, 
they considered themselves superior. They were the Brahmins, the uh, Kshatriyas and the Sudras. Oh, sorry, and the Vaishyas. On the other hand, the dark-skinned people, they were the Dravidians, Aryans and Dravidians. They were told, you are low caste, your duty is to serve us. And to, to rationalize that, they come up with the story about how God made man. Now the Buddha comes along and says, no, God did not make humans different. God created only one type of human beings. He did not create four castes. Yeah? All humans are born equal, and I say humans, meaning even women. Men, and I'm, I'm going to show this here. Even men and women may be physically dif different. This is the Buddhist stand. Men and women may be physically different, but spiritually, women have exactly the same power to gain perfection. So uh, when you become an Arahant, whether you are male or female does not matter. Males and females. There's a lovely little story there. One day there was a nun, yeah, and this nun was meditating. When she was meditating, Mara, Mara is the bad guy in Buddhism, Mara appears to her and he makes fun of her. And he says, hey, you women, you know, this is the whole Indian attitude towards women coming through. He says, you women, you are meditating, you want to gain Arahanta Hoda. How can you, with your two-finger intelligence, with your two-finger intelligence, how can you gain arahantahood? Now, what does two-finger intelligence mean? Uh, you know, in the old days when we had no rice cookers, when we want to cook rice, yeah, we put the rice, wash the rice, then we put water into see enough water or not, we use two fingers. We put the two fingers and see always, yeah? Now, Women can be cooking rice for 50 years. But for 50 years, they'll always use the two fingers. Okay? Agala! You know, after you've done it so many times, you know, okay, no, no, no. They must use two fingers. So that is why Mara calls them the women have two finger intelligence. Alright? And so, don't waste your time. So what does this uh, venerable uh, reply? She says, Mara, yeah, you make fun of the fact that I am a woman and you talk about my intelligence and you say that I cannot meditate. But, now this is the important point, but when one's mind is under control, when one's mind cannot shake in the presence of a disturbance, what does it matter that I am a woman or there is a man? So in Buddhism, we don't differentiate between men and women. So that, that goes again back to Mahabrahma creating the four castes, the four Varnas. Okay, now, when the Buddha came along, one of the first things the Buddha did was when he allowed monks to join the Buddhist order, he did not care what caste people belong to. For example, when the uh, three Pitaka was put together after the Buddha passed away, all the 500 Arahants joined and they recited the three Pitaka. The sutras, they were recited by Venerable Ananda. Ananda was a cousin of the Buddha, so Kshatriya, upper caste. But the one who recited the Vinaya rules, the Vinaya rules was a barber, low caste barber. But he was selected to recite, meaning that the Buddha did not care about the caste system. This is one of the biggest contributions Buddha made to Indian culture. No caste. Anyway, uh, when, when the, uh, the, the, the four castes were like this, when the Buddha allowed the monks to join his order, all equal, 
the Brahmins who were outside used to catch hold of the monks who were Brahmins. Those who had been Brahmins who joined, they went and made fun. Hey, you both, you fellas, uh, you all got no shame. Uh, you all born, born from the mouth of Brahma. Now what? You go and mix with the Shudra fellas. Your cars all, you're dirty, you're smelly. Yeah, you, you black fellas. They actually call them, we are white. You, are, you join with these black fellas. You have become defiled. Now, two young Brahmins had been abused by the Brahmins from their village earlier. So they were worried. Yeah? They were worried. And picture this. It's evening. The Buddha is taking his evening walk. So it's all very peaceful, very quiet. And this old man, the Buddha, is walking up and down. And these two very young monks, Brahmins, come and say, we have this question to ask. Yeah? But do you think it's the proper time? So they f go behind the Buddha. And then, <clears throat> and the Buddha says, yes. And then they say, Master, we have this problem. We are being abused by the Brahmins. We are being abused. By, uh, this has to do with beginnings and endings. Agganya Sutra, how the world began. Okay? Now, but it is important to stress that the Buddha was not interested in talking about the beginning of the world. In doing what, he's, what I'm going to tell you about now, he, by the way, explains the beginning of the world from a Buddhist point of view. That's not his intention. After I told you about Malunkya Putta, but he had a different intention. Okay, continue. Uh, the Buddha tells, uh, uh, what is the question? The question is, the monks, the Brahmins are saying, we have lost our caste by joining with the low caste, number one. Number two, the Brahmins claim they are superior because they came from the mouth of Brahma. They say that the Shudras came from the feet. And they say, when we mix with the Shudras, we become defiled. Yeah, we become defiled. Um, there is a, the Code of Manu, which was written long after the Buddha actually. And in the Code of Manu, it clearly states that if a Brahmin's shadow, get this, yeah? Code of Manu. If the Brahmin's shadow falls on a Shudra, the Brahmin gets defiled. Now, you work out the logic of that. I'm walking, my shadow falls on him. And when my shadow falls him, I become defiled and I can beat him up for being in the wrong place. It was that bad. And the Buddha tried to fight this kind of things. Okay? The fact that the Koda Manu comes 500 years later shows the Buddha wasn't very successful. Okay? But we come back. Now, the Buddha says, I hope you are, I'm following, you're following my line of thinking. Uh, the Buddha says, Young men, Vasetta, I'm telling you, the Buddha, the Brahmins claim to be superior and all of that. They claim that Brahma made them from the mouth, the arms and so on. I'm telling you that is not true. This was the Buddha's purpose. The Buddha's purpose was to show all humans are equal and there is no such thing as the caste system. To do that, the Buddha had to talk about the origin of the world. And that is where we have this sutra, the Agganya Sutra. And it, Agganya means the beginning. The sutra on the beginning of the world. Now, according to this sutra, the Buddha says, now you can, at the back of your mind, you can see how very close it comes to what science has discovered today. Okay, he says, in the beginning, the world was a dark, cold place. It was very dark and very cold and uninhabited. All right, and one day, or at a, a, a time came, a time came when 
certain beings of light. This is important. Now the question is, does the world, was the world created? Was human beings created by God? The Buddhist stand is, no, life was not created, but life migrated. Life migrated from another uh, uh, cosmos. Because we believe that worlds are always being created and being destroyed. Somewhere along the line, when the world, one world comes to an end, all the beings there do not die. They cannot die because they haven't attained nirvana. So they come and colonize another world. You get that? That when a universe collapses, because universes are all the time being created and being destroyed. Being created and being destroyed. What the Buddha says is, uh, each eon, what is an eon is a period of time. One period of time is when once a world has been created, there is a period of expansion, a long, long period of expansion. Then there is a period of contraction. All right? And expansion and contraction. Expansion, continuation of expansion. Contraction, continuation of contraction. It's a long period. But nothing remains the same. So, while other universes are being destroyed, other universes are being created. Did you ever ask yourself, the population of the world is growing and growing and growing. Just to give you an example, did you know that during the time of Jesus Christ, the population of the whole world, that means 2,000 years ago, the world's population was 250 million people. As many people as there are in Indonesia today. 250 million. That was 2,000 years ago. In the 15th century, when America was discovered, 250 became half a million. 200 and... Uh, no, became half a billion, 500 million. 250 be doubles. 1,500 years for 250 to become 500,000. 1776, 200 years later, America gains independence from 500 million human beings on earth. It doubles again in 200 years to 1 billion. The first 1 billion human beings in the world about 200 years ago. Then 1940, 1 billion becomes 2 billion. Doubles again. 1940 to 1990, I was alive at that time, June 1990, 2 billion becomes 5 billion. Today, 20 years later, 7 billion. Where do all these human beings come from? If we are saying that God created them, God is working overtime in his factory. But cannot be. What is the Buddhist stand? The Buddhist stand is worlds are being created, worlds are being destroyed. When worlds are destroyed, beings that have not escaped samsara become, they are not bad, they are not good, they become beings of light. They get converted to energy and they are called beings of light. They float. They float around. When they float around, in our case, planet Earth is just being formed. When planet Earth is... This is, this is the Aganya Sutra, by the way. As planet Earth is getting formed, these beings come and land here. When they land here, originally, because they have no form, they have no body, they are just energy. Because they are just energy, they remain floating 
living on piti, living on happiness. That is the original. Then that, now this is the Four Noble Truths coming in. The cause of all our problem is craving. These beings have not got rid of their craving. So what they do is, when they come to planet Earth, they find that the planet Earth has very rich nutrition. So they start to eating that nutrition from the planet. All right? As that happens, they have once fine bodies, bodies without form, slowly start taking form. Why? Because of greed, they eat. And the more they eat, the more they get tied by gravity. The more they start forming as humans. Okay? Repeat, the Buddha's intention is not to talk about origins. He is talking about Brahmins. But now, he tells how this began. Okay, so, they start eating. As they eat, their bodies become coarse and they become physical. When they, from immaterial, they become material. When they become physical, they become aware that some bodies are beautiful and others are not. At the same time, they begin to become aware, again craving, that there are sexual differences. Now as their cravings are growing, among some of them, not all, what is happening is, there is a little by little deterioration. Okay? These fine light beings are slowly becoming coarse. So they become aware of their sexual differences, lust arises. So they begin to become craving for sex. And then they take part in the sexual act. When they take part in the sexual act, other beings see them and they are disgusted. And they start beating them. So what do they do? Instead of stopping it, they hide and do it. How do they hide? They start hiding in buildings. So now houses come in. So this is how we, we are progressing, okay? We are progressing, but look at my hand. We are going only in one direction. Okay, now houses. Now at the same time, this, as people get more and more coarse, the food that was originally available everywhere, slowly dies off and starts giving uh, way to plants, creepers and so on. These also go away and rise. But that rice is just found and you can just eat it like that. You don't have to cook. Okay? Now, that was how they were eating. Among them there were some who were lazy. Those who were lazy said to themselves, eh, we don't have to go and find the food every day. What we will do is, we will collect for two or three days. Keep two or three days and we will keep in our house. Progression. We are learning harvesting, we are learning farming, we are learning storage, we are progressing. Okay. Then, other beings look at them and say, hey, these clever fellas, they have collected and kept. Now we, it's easy for us. We don't have to go and collect. We will steal. So they learn how to steal. And when they learn how to steal, they have to start locking their doors. Now a lot of things are happening little by little. And so they start fighting. And when they start fighting, they start developing weapons and so on. And when all of this comes to a stage, progress comes to a stage where they cannot handle it anymore, what do they do? The first form of government. They get together and they say to, they have a meeting. And at this meeting they say, let us choose among ourselves one who is the strongest and one who is the handsomest. And we will give him the authority to punish those who need punishing. All right? And to preserve law and order. 
we call him Mahasamatta. That means an elected leader. So what the Buddha says is, the first form of government was a democracy, where everybody chooses it. Kings and all come later. So they chose their leader. Okay? Then, of course, as time goes on, uh, and the guy who is chosen, now he doesn't have to work. What we will do is, whatever we collect, we will give him a portion. Taxation has been invented. You see? So how the, the Buddha talks about this. Now we haven't come to our point yet. The point is now Brahmins. While humans... Ah, I promised you about the position of women. Notice, right from the beginning... Unlike in the Bible, women were created inferior to man. There is no such concept in Buddhism at all. Those beings were sexless. Then when they changed into male and female, they were just different, not senior and inferior. Not superior and inferior. And that is the Buddhist mentality even today. That women are not inferior to men, but different. Okay, now we continue. So, uh, among this group, now, Brahmins from the mouth, Kshatriyas from the arms, Vaishyas from the leg, Shudras from the feet. The Buddha says that is not how humans were created. What happened was, among those people there, there were people with different tendencies, different characteristics, different character. There were those who liked to teach. There were those who liked to use their brains. There were those who liked to think about God and so on. These more spiritually inclined people became the Brahmin. They were not created superior. They became Brahmins due to their natural tendency. That was the first law. Kshatriyas, on the other hand, there were those, as we have in today's society, naturally born leaders. Those who are natural leaders, they became the Kshatriyas. And those who like farming and those who like business to support the economy, so you see the priest class, the priest or the uh, uh, the priest class or the uh, uh, what do you call it? The teachers, the teachers and the preachers. They use their mouths. Therefore, they they are the first. Then comes the warriors who fight. Yeah. Then comes the 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 priests, the 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 rajas, the rulers. Then the economic class, Vaishyas. They are not castes. They are simply classes of people. And then, of course, there are those who are born maybe less intelligent, maybe more rough, and so on. They are what becomes the Shudras. So what the Buddha is saying is that people were not created different, but these classes were part of evolution. And I ask you to see my hand. This is all what we call development, progression. Okay? Development, progression. Uh, and, and we say this is good. But what is happening is, while there is a progression towards a, a material development, spiritually we are degenerating. Now that is the point. The more we go up, the more we degenerate spiritually. There is nothing wrong with development and progress, the Buddha says. What we need to know is while we have that, we must also develop spiritually. So the two must go hand in hand. When this does not happen, we have the situation in the world today. We have more guns, more everything, yeah, and yet we are, we are, we are becoming worse. So, 
you want progress, no problem, the Buddha says. In Buddhism, of course, we have no problem with progress, with development and so on. Okay? Now, uh, maybe we can stop at this point. The point that I want to uh, stop with is beginning of the world. What about the end of the world? As far as Buddhists are concerned, it is not eschatology. The world will not end in one sudden go. The world cannot end. And you saw all the embarrassments that the other religions had in 1999. Remember, last year we had the Mayan calendar. Everybody was waiting, 23rd December, nothing happened. Yeah? Buddhists were very calm about it. We, 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 we don't believe. Because when does the world end? Every time you breathe out, your world ends. Every time you breathe in, your world begins. Breathe in, breathe out. That's the beginning of a world and an end of the world. Alright. Having said that, whatever we call planet Earth today is the result of coming together of raw material from another explosion 15 billion years ago. And part of that ended 5 billion years ago. Planet Earth was formed. From planet Earth, the moon was formed, and etc., etc., etc. I always love to ask my students this question, how old are you? When I ask them, how old are you? Straight away, they are, oh, 20 years old. <laughs> You are not 20 years old, my friend. You are 20 billion years old. Why? Because all the carbon, phosphorus, magnesium, sulfur, whatever you are made of, yeah, came with the Big Bang. And when you die, that's not the end. These things get recycled again and again. So you are recycled material 20 billion years old. And it goes beyond that as well. And when you die, that's not the end. You're going to become raw material for some nuclear generator somewhere. Okay? So, when we have that attitude, we don't believe in an end. And the Buddha tells us, worrying about that is a waste of time. Malunkya Putta, you are struck by the poison arrow of samsara you have no time you need to pull it out straight away and now is the time to begin not wait yeah the buddha talks about when a man's beard is on fire yeah he is not going to sit down and ask how did this fire begin now what is the temperature of beard burning fire and what is the composition of the smoke that comes out? Now, who started the fire? When your beard is on fire, you don't ask all those questions. You jump into the well to get rid of it. Jump into the well. Yeah? You are struck by the poison arrow of samsara. And you are suffering as a result. And what is the cause of that suffering? Your craving for living. You're craving for unnecessary questions and answers. What the Buddha calls questions that do not lead to edification. Questions that do not lead to understanding. What does it matter to you whether God made the world or not? You are suffering here now. And there's nothing... That's why Confucius said, heaven knows how to look after itself. When the tsunami struck, did heaven get wet? Heaven didn't even know. We had to do the dying. So that's what the Buddha says. Take it in your own hands. Do it yourself. And when do we start? Now. And stop worrying about beginning and ending of the world. Thank you.